Um, yeah, the British also would have fur traders and things like that, but um, only after the French and Indian War were they really coming into that area. And that period was a lot shorter. That was for about 20, 30 years until the American Revolution happened. Um, when the American Revolution happened, uh, George Washington, uh, the Seneca were still friends with the British and um, ended up, uh, you know, when Washington ordered uh, General Sullivan to come up here and pretty much uh, wrested um, uh, Seneca control from them um, for the Americans. And after uh, the revolution happened, there was a big push by the new country of America to try to do westward expansion. And now when we think westward expansion, we think wild west of boom towns and things like that. But back then, the west was this area. We were the wild west, you know. And uh, you know, the pioneers that came in there all had crazy names like Rattlesnake Pete or you know, stuff like this, you know. And they were all wild people. Um, Hardy and um, you know, they came in this area. But there was a real big push to populate this area because the English still controlled Canada, and there was always the thought that if we don't put people in there, the English are going to start to encroach. And so there was encouragement um, to try to uh, settle in the area. And so one of the first settlements um, was the city of Tryon. Um, it was uh, set up originally by this name, guy named John Lusk, and you can see where his uh, house would have been right over here. He bought it at first, but he quickly ended up selling it to Sam and Tryon and his brother, hence where the city gets its name from. Um, they're from Massachusetts, and they didn't even know what the place looked like at first. They saw some maps. They decided to go ahead and draw out what the community would look like from Massachusetts, and then finally came out here and built it. And pretty much all these buildings were pre-designed except for the school, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, these are just an example. There was a much more structures than this. Um, I think the settlement was around like about 550 in its heyday, you know, and it also was a support for a lot of the farms and things in the area. Uh, what was going on is that agriculture was becoming a big push, uh, especially growing of wheat, which later Rochester would become really famous for. But um, wheat in Penfield and in Webster would be brought, you know, and Pittsburgh would be brought to the Irondequoit Creek where mills were set up and the mills would then grind it and then it would be shipped. And for the most part, interesting enough, this is pre-canal days. So the center for our area wasn't New York City as you would think. The center was more Montreal and that's where most of our trading went on was with the British, you know, in the early days. Um, some of the structures that um, were on the site and I'd like to see explored a little bit was uh, one was a five-story warehouse. This is one of the first buildings that was built right there. It would be pretty much where the fort was located at. This is a reproduction, well, not a reproduction, but this is an example of a warehouse from that time period and what it perhaps would look like. The warehouse was basically to store all the goods, you know, so that it could be later used for shipping. Um, another one of the buildings, oh, the graveyard. Now, the graveyard's of a particular point of interest to me. Um, I have a, a, a real fascination with uh, cemeteries and graveyards, especially in the local area. This graveyard in particular um, would have had like wooden headstones like we see here, you know. They probably would have rotted away. And what's really um, interesting, um, when you look at cemetery records, there is no records of these bodies ever being relocated. Um, they're still more likely, more than likely on site right now. And, um, you know, they kind of are where the parking lot is to the dog park. If you were to be able to dig underneath it, that's kind of where it would be. But it's well, one of the more interesting places, I think, that you know, a dig could go on. Um, the next thing, and this is the big importance of the area, besides the fur trading. After the fur trading kind of died down a little bit, what uh, the area be really became important for was agriculture. And uh, grist mills, basically grain mills, were um, set up in the area. And they have those large gray stones. You see them all over Rochester. They kind of use them as like, you know, decorative things nowadays. But, you know, back then they were, you know, pretty important. And what they had were undershot uh, mills. That's what these are. The water would come along the bottom, it would hit here, it would spin the wheel, and then it would keep on going. Um, an undershot mill is, you know, it's pretty good. It's a lot better than having to try to grind it with like a donkey or whatever however they used to do it before water power. But um, it's not quite as effective as an overshot mill, which takes water and then puts it over the top here. That's three to five times more efficient as far as energy is concerned. And that doesn't seem like much, but it's real important as to why the city did not um, continue to exist. Um, the Rondequoit Creek is very devoid of much in the way of waterfalls and rapids, and that made it real attractive as a, you know, a place to bring boats up and down. Um, Rochester, on the other hand, had huge falls and made it very unattractive for like shipping, but once milling started taking place, 
it became very, very, uh, you know, it became a very effective site. And this would later lead to, um, you know, the less significant Tryon and its mills disappearing and the focus being on the new center, which would be Rochester. Um, but grist mills, and we, um, you know, this area in general, just to give you a little bit of an idea of history, um, back in the uh, 30s, 1830s and stuff, we were the number one producer of uh, flour in the world. Um, we were the number one wheat producer. Um, and we kept um, right up there in the top for like many, many years. And of course, that's why Rochester was known as the Flower City, hence the name. Um, if you go down to um, Arondequoit Creek today, there is a flour mill that still exists. It's not a flour mill anymore. It's a uh, you know, place where they do like weddings and stuff like that. But a lot of the milling stuff is still there, so you can get an idea of what it's like. Um, the Daisy Flour Mill is right in that general area. It's kind of cool. You should check it out sometime. Um, one of the other things that uh, are, are listed there are distilleries and asheries. Um, both of them were kind of important. Asheries, basically, um, you know, farmers would come and they would clear out large sections of land. And, you know, I mean, you got slash and burn agriculture, but there was also another use for ash that was real important. Um, that especially finer ashes would be um, saved, and they call them like pearl ashes if they were really good. And they would <coughs> bring them off to um, England, and they would make, um, you know, pottery and stuff like that, really fine ware. And that's where it really became useful. So there was a big market for that. And at the same time, you killed the you know, another stone by clearing off land so you could use it for wheat production. The other thing that was real important in the, that time period, which is also located there, was the distillery. Now, back then, water wasn't as clean as it is today. Um, you know, you had a lot more contaminants in it. There was something called, like, the Genesee fever you could get, uh, mainly from mosquitoes hanging out in, like, swampy areas. People were getting sick off the water. And a lot of the time, especially in these new, like, pioneer settlements and stuff like that, alcohol became real important. Um, hard ciders were really, really popular, and beers and stuff like that. Um, you know, trading was often done not just in cash, but was also done in alcohol. It served a very important function. Like when you got up in the morning, you didn't get a glass of water, you got a glass of hard cider to go with your breakfast. And this is just kind of how it was because, you know, the alcohol killed any types of bacteria. And so the distillery played a very important function, and, um, you know, it's another interesting place that could be explored. There's an example of, like, uh, what a distillery would be like in an ashery. Um, the schoolhouse. Now, the schoolhouse is an interesting representation. Like everything else that everything else that was pretty much built there, other than some of the mills, were um, pre-designed and you know were planned out by um, Tryon and his people. Um, the schoolhouse was not. The schoolhouse was built by the settlers themselves. They decided it was one of the first. It was the very first building that the community built as a whole, and they decided they needed. And the schoolhouse was located right near the creek. It would have been very similar to this structure, um, and. Uh, you know, basically, it's where the kids went to school and learned stuff, you know. And, uh, but they felt that it was a very important thing. You know, they were trying to build a whole new community and stuff. Um, some of the artifacts that we might find from the period, you know, um, you know, we've got some more metal. We've got, like, uh, brass nails and stuff like that. You know, maybe some pipes and things, uh, you know. Um, but these are some of the possible artifacts that might be around the area if we were to dig in it. <coughs> Okay, today we have some uh, things that date back from the area. Um, the Stone Tolan House is a really famous uh, landmark in Rochester, and you can go see it, and it's pretty much in its original state as it was back then. Uh, you can go explore the area. Um, Orrin Stone, he's the one who built the house. Um, uh, Sam and Tryon and Oliver Culver, who would probably be the most famous person that lived in the settlement, um, stayed in this house. Tryon himself built two houses that are still in existence today if you were to go there. These um, were for important people coming into the area, um, you know, travelers that might be going through. They were kind of like semi-boarding houses as well as like residential areas. Oliver Culver, who Culver is named after, used to stay at these houses. He also stayed at um, Orrin Stone's house here. Um, he then later on built his own house in 1804. Culver is also uh, noted as the person to launch the largest schooner. Now, the Arondequoit Creek has changed even from then. It used to be a lot deeper and stuff, but he launched a 48-ton schooner out of the Arondequoit Creek. He had like eight oxen pull it down there, and I have no idea how he could launch something so big, but he's recorded with doing that, the biggest boat in the area. Um, the War of 1812 also... Um, he, uh, affected the area. The British did come into the Irondequoit Bay as well as into the Genesee. Um, they did raiding missions. Um, they didn't ever actually like uh, 
you know, they, they landed troops a couple times, but they never stayed. They just came there to loot and destroy stuff, you know, and that was pretty much it. Um, after the, the war and stuff, the, the America really decided that we needed to push Western expansion, and we had the canal built through the city of Rochester. It was decided. Um, as well as the milling going on. And with these two things, with the canal becoming the new artery, and it didn't go through that area, and didn't really hit up with the Irondequoit Creek, and with the increase of the mills, the need for Tryon just kind of disappeared, and slowly people just moved out. The two um, houses, the Salmon's, uh, uh, the two Tryon houses that still exist today were still there and were still being used up until the modern era, but everything else pretty much went by the wayside. And, uh, that's about what I got there for you. <clears throat> hey, do we have time for questions? Do we have any questions Well, it's an interesting situation. I was just asking, what was that guy's name? He was from the Rochester Museum and Science Center. Do you remember what was? The Rochester Science Center guy. <laughs> I was talking, Sarah Pilio. Okay. Anyway, I was talking to him. He said, you know, like I said, the site is fairly pristine, so it's kind of like attractive in that sense, and it has some interesting historical evidence we can definitely learn about. It's stuff that isn't recorded. It is a public park, though. So getting permission from that might be a little tricky. Um, my hope basically is that if I can get enough information and stuff together that maybe at some point present it to them as like an endeavor that would be good for their benefit as well, you know. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. That, and you just brought up the very reason why. It was not on the canal. And so because it was not on the canal, the Tryon originally was set up to deal with the British. You know what I mean? It didn't have like connections to New York. It didn't have connections to the new country that was being found. Although as part of the United States, our, its trading partners were across the water. After the War of 1812, there was a real big push to stop doing as much business there. And then the canal came in. And with the advent of the canal, trade stopped going from that direction and started heading to New York City. That's where the new markets were. And that's where the big population centers were. And so it just became less attractive you know, as a site. Also, the Genesee River, we start to see Charlotte take off as a new port town, and that becomes much more important, especially within relation to the mills on the Genesee. And Irondequoit Creek settlement just becomes less and less you know, needed and becomes obsolete. And so with the lack of money being made there, the lack of interest, you know, and so it just kind of pushed to the city of Rochester, where the canal was after all. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming today. If you are interested in any local archaeological projects, we are running a summer field school in July in Pifford, New York, which is right near Geneseo. So for the month of July, you can get six credits going out and digging on a, <laughs> a similar period site to this. If anyone is at all interested, please contact me. But I hope you enjoyed a little look at uh, kind of what we're doing over in the archaeology department in the broad range of topics that we try to take on. Thank you very much for coming and enjoy the rest of Scholars Day.